Hi, this is uh, Gary Lovett. I'm from the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, and I'm the lead PI at the Hubbard Brook LTER. Uh, for those of us, those of you who don't know us, we're at a uh, the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, which is a Forest Service research site in central New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, in terms of site news, well, we just had our uh, midterm site review in June. That went quite well. We got some great feedback from the committee, which was chaired by Eric Sibloom. We have a new proposal that's due in 2022, and we've already started planning for that. We have lots of exciting new initiatives at the site. There's, there's one group that's working on what we call hydropedology. It's the interaction between hydrology, soil development, and the flow and chemistry of streams. Uh, there's another group that's working on modeling the multiple driver of the vegetation dynamics at the site, particularly the forest dynamics and the change in species composition in the forest. We have several groups working on spring and fall phenology and ecosystem dynamics. So in our in our climate that has uh, snowpacks over the winter, the, the timing of snowpack and, and bud burst is changing, and this affects ecosystem processes fairly strongly. Uh, there's another group working on stream metabolism. We have sort of a revitalized stream group at, at Hubbard Brook, and they're working on climate and particularly the shoulder season impacts on stream metabolism. Uh, Emily Bernhardt and her crew at uh, Duke is working on new ways for data access and visualization from the, from the long-term Hubbard Brook data. And one thing that we're doing that I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking about is a new project that's connecting biogeochemistry and biodiversity. So we're, we're well known for long-term records of biogeochemistry at Hubbard Brook. We have records of precipitation chemistry and stream chemistry and uh, hydrology and everything. But we, perhaps you don't know that we also have long-term records of many animal populations. A lot of these are uh, because of the hard work of uh, two investigators, Richard Holmes, who was from Dartmouth, and Nick Rodenhaus from Wellesley. Um, uh, both of them are continuing to to work on the project, but uh, Dick started the the songbird records back in 1968. You can see the graph here on the left. Uh, some of those trends that he's he's measured over time in some of our more important uh, songbirds. So we're talking about over 50 years of record of these songbirds. We also have over 30 years of sampling of uh, leaf eating insects. You can see the graph on the right. Uh, up and down of uh, caterpillars on beech and maple leaves at the site. Uh, so uh, we've over the, over the course of studying both these, the, these long-term measurements and also some, some work on the population dynamics of these insects, there's a, there's a couple of interesting things that we've learned. One is that these folivorous insect populations are highly variable from year to year. And, and they're controlled by weather and by the quality of the food supply. And the main determinant of the quality of the food supply is the nitrogen in leaves because the insects are highly nitrogen limited. Another thing we've learned is that the bird populations are also highly variable. And the nesting success of the birds is dependent on the supply of folivorous insects. So you can see there a connection between the nitrogen uh, in the leaves, the insect population, and the bird populations. The insects, particularly the caterpillars, are our main primary consumer at the site, and at least in the green food web. The bird populations are a really important uh, secondary consumer uh, in the system. So that leads us to hypothesize that foliar nitrogen plays a key role in this ecosystem. Uh, we know that there's a strong correlation between foliar nitrogen and the net primary productivity of the system, the NPP. Uh, we, as I just said, there's a relationship between the foliar nitrogen and the performance of insect populations, particularly leaf-eating caterpillars, and that those leaf-eating caterpillar populations affect the songbird populations. We also know that foliar nitrogen affects the litterfall nitrogen, and that's an important resource for the brown food web, all those fungi, bacteria, and, and invertebrates that feed in the litter and forest floor. And of course, that nitrogen coming down in litter is also very important in soil carbon and nitrogen cycling and the interactions between those two elements. So you can see a relationship here between the biogeochemistry of the system and the biodiversity of the system, particularly the insect and songbird biodiversity.
We also know that there's a lot of factors that affect all this interaction of uh, nitrogen without, within the system. Climate change certainly does, and carbon dioxide does. And there are strong parallels here with the work from the Kanza Prairie site that Welty et al. published uh, that uh, showed that at Kanza, increasing CO2 has reduced the nitrogen concentration of the plants, and that has affect the, affected the grasshopper population. So there's a similar relationship between an external driver, uh, plant nitrogen concentration, and uh, insect populations. And I think there's a strong uh, possibility for some good cross-site work there. Of course, uh, soil and nitrogen deposition affect that nitrogen cycling. And there's also a really interesting issue with phenology and synchrony. We need to maintain a synchrony between bud birth by the trees, uh, insect uh, uh, emergence and consumption of leaves, and songbird arrival and, and nesting at, at the site. And climate change has the potential to disrupt that synchrony, and we have a group working on that. And the two people who are going to take this project further on are two young uh, scientists at the site. Uh, Nina Laney is uh, with Forest Service, and Mike Hallworth is soon to start as a postdoc at the Cary Institute. Uh, they'll be leading this uh, project about the relationship between uh, biogeochemistry and biodiversity at the site. Our approach here is to, uh, well, we can use the long-term data to sort of get at the trends in nitrogen cycling at the site. But we have a, we can use spatial variation in foliar nitrogen across the Hubbard Brook Valley uh, to look for hotspots and to do comparisons between high and nitrogen, high and low foliar nitrogen sites. So when you're measuring foliar nitrogen across the valley, of course, we have our own tried and true method of, of uh, shooting leaves down uh, from the trees with a shotgun, as you can see in this picture on the right. Uh, but we also can look at foliar nitrogen using remote sensing. The image on the left uh, is from hyperspectral remote sens sensing. This is from the Avarice instrument that's run by NASA. And it is, a, is able to measure from the sky canopy nitrogen. And so the, the outline here is the entire Hubbardburg Valley. It's about 30 square kilometers. Uh, the dots on this are sampling points where we have uh, permanent vegetation plots. And the colors uh, represent foliar nitrogen. You can see a strong variation uh, with high foliar nitrogen in, in some places, in the valleys with low uh, foliar nitrogen throughout the valley. So we can use that contrast to try to understand the differences in the um, transfer of nitrogen and, and energy uh, throughout the food web and how if that's controlled by the foliar nitrogen. And our goal here is, is understanding how biogeochemistry is linked to the food webs in the ecosystem. Thanks, that's, that's all I have.